Just want to pause with a moment of silence in gratitude for Mother Nature and the spirit of Iboga and its magnanimous, wildly generous, intelligent, fierce nature, this healer and this teacher. So if you want, you can pause, close your eyes, go within and just take a few grounding breaths to fully be here and cultivating some gratitude for this spirit. We're inviting in the spirit of Iboga and the Buiti to help us. You can open your eyes. Thank you for taking a moment for me. Uh, we want to say a big thank you to all of the speakers tonight and all of you. Thank you for supporting and making this possible and supporting San Francisco Psychedelic Society. They are doing amazing work for education and community. Shout out to Decriminalize Nature, making big ripple effects across the world right now. And The Haven in Oakland, our beautiful speakers sharing their time and wisdom and experience. Uh, thank you to Chor Boogie for creating the Iboga inspired artwork that has been being shared. And a big shout out to our friends, Tyler Chandler and Nick Myers, the filmmakers of Dosed. So if you haven't seen Dosed, this is an amazing documentary about a woman's journey through recovery and soul healing with both sacred mushrooms and then Iboga for the deep detox. And you can check that out at dosedmovie.com. We want to give a big shout out to Sacred Solidarity that's happening this weekend that connects the Psychedelic Medicine Liberation Movement with other social justice movements. It's a free online festival. We all need to party right about now and get festive. And that's this Sunday. It's going to be intellectually lit. There will be panels. There, MAPS is hosting an after party, which should get pretty colorful. So Google up Sacred Solidarity or check out the hashtag. There's a lot there. Um, and it's free. It's free to attend. So we want to honor our Buiti community. We, we did invite uh, a Buiti friend from Gabon who is an English speaker and the timing just didn't work out. And we want to let you know that we have an intention to feature our Buiti community in future events where we have all the support we need with translators to really open that up both online and eventually when we heal from this in person. So, so shout out. Big thanks to the Bwiti for helping us learn about this medicine that they've studied for eons. So quick note that this is for informational and harm reduction purposes only. This is not meant to replace medical advice. This is not meant as diagnosis, prescription, or even suggestion. Maybe a warning, <laughs> that's all. But no, um, so we wanna be very clear about that, just harm reduction and information. And before we get moving, I wanna acknowledge that this is a very complex subject. And we are not attempting to offer a comprehensive curriculum for supporting medicine work with Iboga or Ibogaine. We are, uh, we are, however, you know, this is an introduction, keep everyone as safe as possible. We are looking into creating our full medical seminar, which we were going to do in person online uh, through Third Wave right now. Third Wave platform is a great informational platform. So stay tuned. We're looking at about six months. And you can connect with us on social media. You have our websites on the event invitation and ticket link where you can track us down, keep an eye out, join email lists, and, and we'll let you know. So we're going to start with a panel discussion with specific topics, and then we're going to open it up for community Q&A later. So we just ask that you hold your questions until that time when we open up for community Q&A. 
We will have one quick five minute break during the talk. So just know that that's coming. Please try to keep yourself muted uh, when you're not speaking. And, and uh, we're gonna bring some awareness here to the medicine of presence, right? To be fully here if that's possible for you. It's really easy to be distracted these days. Many of us are multitasking. And if possible, you're invited to settle, get comfortable, and just be fully here. What a luxury these days, right? Um, <laughs> what a luxury to be fully here. So we want to also mention that we're scratching the surface. This is an iceberg, tip of the iceberg. And there's a lot of great resources on the web. You can check out the Global Ibogaine Therapy Alliance at ibogainealliance.org. Maps. Dot org, ICERS, the acronym I C E E R S. On my website, I have a lot of harm reduction information that's free. It's ebast.net. That's E B A S as in Sam, T as in Tom.net. And Siba Ibogaine is Jonathan's website for his Ibogaine coaching and support. He has great resources there. And that's C E I B A Ibogaine.com. So with that rolling in, I am so humbled by this powerful spirit of Iboga. We have seen some things, this crew of speakers. We have seen some things, and often it can be a rough road to healing. I've seen big adults pass out cold from a little bit of root bark, uh, narrowly saved from head injuries by chores strength <laughs> and Patrick's strength and and I know people who have Basi. died Basi yes I we know people who have died when they when they misuse the medicine whether maybe they didn't mean to and sometimes they mean to you know this medicine has a purpose so this medicine demands a lot of respect people absolutely uh, die regularly in unsafe settings, even with microdoses, and we'll talk about that. And this affects our social evolution with sacred medicines, and we understand that there are a lot of people who, there's a lot of people who uh, are in need of great healing, who are suffering, and hopefully we'll, we'll get to touch on privilege and access and things you can do now if you can't afford ibogaine treatment. We're hoping to get to that. Uh, so stay tuned. And we are in this beautiful learning curve with psychedelics. And this is a fierce medicine, a fierce, fierce medicine. Uh, and a beautiful medicine. So the harm reduction, as I understand it, begins with our intention. And in my understanding, the biggest contraindication for any medicine is to have an intention that does not align with the divine purpose of that botanical teacher of that earth medicine. And iboga doesn't want to just take out our inner garbage. It doesn't just want to detox us. This plant wants to heal us up in mind, body, and soul, and teach us the art of living, the art of being human. It blesses us with vision, energy, health, and connectedness to the ecosystem. So there's that warning, you know, when you let Iboga in, don't let it into one room only. Let it into, into the whole life. Uh, that will be the sweet way. There's an easy way and there's a difficult way. And we never want to fight Iboga. No one can ever win. That, uh, it's a powerful medicine. And that's just my understanding, having been a Bwiti initiate and going to Africa three times and spending a lot of time getting intimate with this plant. So also our healing does not happen separate from the whole. So we will talk about sustainability and social impact and why our planetary healing is connected. So with that, I'm going to ask our speakers to share it. And it's hard to put this in a nutshell, in a laser-like one-minute nutshell. Uh, but tell us. Briefly describe your first experience with iboga or ibogaine, or one that stands out to you. So I'll just go to the left there. Um, Patrick, go for it. Unmute yourself. 
so my first experience, um, I came after working with the medicine for quite some time, and I couldn't partake because I had a, something with my heart going on. So when I eventually that had that fixed, I was able to lay down, um, and I went in for the purpose of asking questions and clarity and getting some help from the ancestors and, and from the medicine that I met, which was very powerful. And in a nutshell, I, you know, I asked how it could help me with certain things, and uh, <clears throat> it, you know, it, it came to me very clear. You know, sometimes it speaks to you, sometimes it's vision, sometimes it's words. And mine was, mine was, it, it was very just words. And the biggest thing for me was, you know, to let things go. As a critical care nurse, you know, I've got to do everything, be everywhere, always bang, 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 bang. And that's been a long time thing. So for me, my biggest experience was uh, it taught me to let it go um, of, of things that don't serve me. And it literally rocked my world. I couldn't. I couldn't get up for like almost seven days. I was every time I every time I lift my head, I was tossing and vertigo, and it was it was it just. But I needed to because while that was going on, uh, my wife came to be my nurse, and there was a other other clients there as well. And I wanted to get up and see how my clients were. Now, Bob was like, "No, no, 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 no. You got to stay there and look after your own damn self." It's like, but no, but I guess gonna go look, and you know, and it was fierce, fierce, loving and fierce, mm -hmm. loving and fierce, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Michelle, go for it. Um, I think for me, when uh, I was able to um, first lay down with the medicine, I, you know, it really taught me that I didn't necessarily need to see and revisit and hash over the things that were causing me pain that it was enough just to release them and that's really what I did <laughs> and it was it was great it was a beautiful experience of learning how to um allow yourself to just be thank you so much Charles are you here would you like to unmute yourself and share yeah yeah sure yeah um so my first experience was about seven years ago and i went to northern mexico to treat a heroin addiction that i developed and so i my first experience was with ibogaine and um it was it was difficult it uh it was exhaustive it was nothing like what I wanted or hoped for. And it was epiphanic and miraculous. And it gave me um, the clear, the very clear understanding of the root of my problems and that they all were belied by self-hatred. And when I came out of my experience, I didn't carry that anymore. So, yeah. Oh, beautiful, man. That sounds about right. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Jonathan, would you like to share? Mm, sure. Yeah. I, I think it makes the most sense for me to share about my initiation. It wasn't the first time that I took Iboga or Ibogaine. I had this benefit of being able to be around treatments for a long time. And so I was really familiar with it and had done a lot of smaller doses. Um, but definitely the initiation in Gabon, um, where I went in 2014, the first time to a Bando village was the first in order of magnitude and importance for me. So, I mean, I didn't see anything. <laughs> I, it was a really, really heavy experience. I always describe it as like a rich void. Like I went into the space of no thought for a couple of days and gradually climbed out of it. And really the benefit for me came in feeling like I had this new ground to um, my spiritual life, a new connection with my body. And it took like, I don't know, I always think back, like it took a couple of years for the little things in my life, like the way that I made decisions to kind of 
ripple onto that new foundation and re realign. So, I mean, everything about my life changed afterwards, the way that I was working and, you know, a lot of my, my relationships with people and everything changed a lot afterwards. So, but it took a long time and it went really deep. So that's why, yeah, that's why I, I would put that one first. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it's not always visionary. Isn't that interesting, but life-changing. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and David and Mia, I want to pop on. Yeah. So um, I, I actually, my first experience was with Ibogaine um, uh, and, and only ever did a boga recently with, with the boga soul, but with Ibogaine, I was with Barry. Um, at Iboga Quest and Arturo and with a friend. Um, and Arturo um, was adopted by a Weechel family. And so I was getting a lot of Weechel kind of downloads as well in the course of the preparation. And we had an amazing sweat. Um, Barry and Arturo took us in and called in the ancestors, you know, calling my dad, Jim, who died 20 years in 1998, my granddad, Emmanuel. And, you know, and just, you know, celebrating and, and, you know, thinking about them. And, you know, my, my granddad had the ovens of the Holocaust behind him, and, you know, and just, you know, my dad had a really difficult life growing up as a foster, you know, a series of foster homes when my granddad went to save the world and, you know, and just, you know, just kind of, but then just, but going in and, um, and my dad did an amazing job with, with um, our family. And so just going in with the medicine, a lot of it was initially, it was kind of like a life review of like you know just kind of classic like judgment day like all this a lot of episodes of unresolved shit and just kind of getting a 360 god's eye view of exactly how things went and like dude that just, you, you know just burning 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 through things but also checking in with friends and family smiles just like really like their laughter and really you know appreciating that and then being in my childhood home and kind of going through a lot of stuff and being in our den and, and, and then the, I, the medicine was just, the genius of it was out of control and like so fast, like a lot of it. But then of all these images, I was in my childhood den and a picture of my dad, like, like you know, just kind of came back. And it was him like in a coach's, a soccer, I, I grew up playing soccer with my dad as a coach and he had this like ecstatic expression, like, you know, just, or just kind of funny, you know, like what, whatever, son, you know, but go get it, you know. And, just as like, and it was just like contemplating him with his World War II books, set of books, like kind of behind. And just, it was like the medicine was just like, is it, pay attention. And, you know, just feeling like, like, and, and just recognizing and feeling and seeing his stature and just like he won and he was just like a child of God on the most mega and see, had a late life conversion experience that he unpacked in a very fundamentalist way, but just seeing it like, in a very pure way. And it was a very Christian trip in some ways of like the new earth that's coming and like all the life on the cross, you know, dying and resurrecting and like the incarnation of creation is the sun and, and you know, we're on the flesh, like eight flesh and star systems and the earth. But I saw my, but to see the statue of my dad at a certain point in the, in the World War II books is like the, the, the conflagration of the world that like the trauma in, in our family and seeing like the phoenix of my dad and, and just like rising out of all that and all that trauma and making this amazing world for me at a certain point like just when i was just in the super like a, a, a like a cupid arrow of four hearts being from his heart to my heart you know just like gold love just pouring and and there's a lot of difficulty in all this too and and like certain and then like i didn't get the whole arrow like i was like i got distracted you know like i got i got the tip and i was like oh love and then i was like i don't know just being pulled at the same time, it got fun when it was a terrible spin and whatever, but eventually got out of that and then was on like in low orbit in my granddad's holding position as all the life artists and activists are fighting the machine. Are we gonna win? Is the earth gonna fucking make it before we go off the climate change cliff? And, you know, and just like all this and then feeling interdimensional presence just plugging in. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, like, and my granddad's just smiling over there. And at a certain point, like just, same golden light, just like on earth, just like washes over. And mm. it was, you know, just incredibly beautiful. And yeah, but a lot of like hard in there, a lot of difficult stuff, uh, you know, but but just some just most beautiful and incredible vision. I just had a really powerful, 
I've been feeling him like combing my granddad's hair uh, when close to the end of his death when, when he was about to die and was able to tell him, I'm gonna get it, I understand you now and I'm gonna dedicate my life to your vision. I've been feeling him this week, like going into this sacred solidarity and just bringing this all together. Like, why am I doing this? It's so nuts. And like, you know, just feeling like him. And then my, and then my dad had a dream of him just the other day that was really powerful. And just feeling, yeah, anyways, resonance to, I don't know, so. Yeah, yeah um, I was fortunate to sit in an Iboga ceremony this past year and um, it was, there were two ceremonies that we did back to back and the first one was very challenging and somewhat frightening. And I had um, the recurring vision that was happening with different characters or different people, or different spirits that would show up and come into my field of view and they were faceless. So I'd keep trying to go and make contact with them but they would disappear. And it was just really distressing and really hard. And I was like, why is this happening? This is horrible, you know? And it was continuous for what felt like, you know, hours like this. And, um, you know, in the morning I, I relayed my story to Elizabeth and she was like, oh, you know, Iboga can be a trickster, you know, think about what that means and reflect on that. And I, I did. And really my first thought was like, well, you know, some of my family hasn't been there for me or they've disappeared, you know, and, and maybe that's it, that I'm missing contact with some of my family and my ancestors and the spirits. And, you know, the next ceremony was, was better for me, was easier because I had a, a sense of peace and, and determination and, and courage and incredible support, you know, so I was able to go in and reconnect with myself and with my grandmother, who I had a very close relationship with and had passed and just had an incredible time connecting with her and getting some very important answers from her that I needed for my self growth. And, you know, the, the lessons and the, the benefit from that ceremony has just been continuing to unfold. And um, recently, you know, I've been able to make a lot of progress on reconnecting with my ancestry and with my living family, you know, and um, my father is here on this panel tonight, you know, in, in gratitude to really the medicine and all of the support that I've received in giving me the courage to want to know my family. You know, I've, I've respected and admired David's family so much of their rich family heritage and history, but I realized that all of us have these ancestors. We all have, you know, hundreds of parents, mothers and fathers, and they're all there, you know, watching us and and guiding us, you know, just there's so much to tap into. So really just begun. Beautiful. Much respect. Thank you for sharing. And Choa Boogie, I I know you got some tales, but but we're gonna we're gonna keep it laser like. Wanna share? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what the fuck is this shit? Beat me up, Scotty. You know, it was like this medicine was so profound, so amazing. Um, I'd have to say that when I first did that medicine, you know, I was scared. I was scared to do it. Um, and I'm not a very fearful type person, even though fear is natural. but um once i did the medicine it was just like what the hell was i scared for there was like no reason to be scared and i think that was one of the major lessons one of the major tools lessons life lessons that um the medicine shared with me was to overcome that that fear you know fear of self and um yeah that medicine was just it was beautiful it just took me blast off, took me out there, took me so far, so deep within that you have no choice but to help correct and heal yourself. You have no choice. It's, it's coming out one way or the other. And that's what that medicine did for me. It just, it just you know, woke me up, took, take the red pill, boom, boom, you plug from the matrix and Wow. Oh, I'm alive. I love my life. Oh my gosh. Like that's just, 
That's just how beautiful that medicine is. You know, granted, all plant medicines are in cahoots. All of them work together. They all have beautiful attributes. But when it comes to Iboga, you know, uh, no, I'm not even going to go there. I'm not even going to put anything on a pedestal. Iboga is just like, it's, it's, shows you what love really is, just like all other plant medicines do. So that's what that did for me. Basi. Basi, thank you, love. Uh, and I'll just throw in my two cents that. Beat me up, Scotty. <laughs> yes, okay. You can mute yourself now. Um, my my first iboga journey was the most brutal medicine journey of my life. It was the Olympics of meditation. It was a trip through the Tibetan Book of the Dead at 900 miles an hour, with puking all night, and 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 I didn't know if I ever wanted to experience the medicine again after that first night. And then I got the message: No, you're here to receive everything that this medicine wants to share with you through the people who know it so well. And the second journey was an avalanche of beauty, unfathomable clarity and, and insight and guidance. And the medicine is so different for everyone, but that was the beginning and it's still unfolding six years later. So I'm really grateful. If you want to read the full story, Heart Medicine, uh, it's available. And now, Patrick, we're going to roll into some um, very exciting topics. So real quick. Uh, what's the difference between iboga and ibogaine? I'm going to attack that real quick. Sure. I'll give you a quick little insight on that. So iboga, tabernathi iboga, right? It's a shrub. Um, it's, it's harvested. You know, they take the outside bark off. There's a little in your skin. They harvest that. Um, we get that in a, a raw form. Over here, we use like root bark, which we can... We can utilize that in our ceremonies as well, but it's also, we can um, refine it a little bit more into the total alkaloids. And now there's some 12 alkaloids that, that we use for mm -hmm. some des desired effects mm -hmm. that we know of, you know? And so that's kind of the, the whole apple, whereas Ibogaine is one of those alkaloids. And that's from um, a real, real careful process of extraction and you can get the ibogaine out of it, you know? And ibogaine is really, it's the ultimate addiction interrupter. You know, it has, when people take ibogaine, um, we can have some uh, psycho-spiritual events and journeys and things like that and, and visions and things come to you. Mm -hmm. But the biggest, the biggest impactful purpose with ibogaine, of course, is the addiction interruption right you can get that with iboga as a whole root obviously because it has ibogaine in it as well so that's the biggest biggest differences between the two of them i think i mean um as far as um as far as like uh ibogaine usually they do it milligram per kilogram you know and that's just like a, a designated rule of thumb i mean you can check with the gita handbook with the global ibogaine therapy alliance they have a really great handbook done out for kind of a go-to guide you know and it's not to say hey you can use this guide and you can run a clinic by any means but it gives you some answers and we don't know anything you at least have a reference to go oh okay so maybe i should ask some questions about this to somebody who knows something about it right so that's kind of the idea around it whereas um iboga we don't do it um, uh, milligram per kilogram. It's done on a very individual basis. And, you know, we work with a provider who knows what they're doing, who's been trained, you know, they know how to read the body, know how to work with the medicine and how to gauge it. Very much like I would have done when I'm in ICU as a nurse, you know, how I gauge my, the morphine I'm giving or, the, or whatever medicine I'm giving to the person. You watch, you look at the person and see how it's reacting and then you gauge from there. So. Those are the two, um, just kind of in a nutshell. It's, it can, you, I could talk all night on the differences between them, but that's kind of a nutshell difference. Great, thank you. So that's that's from the medical perspective, and of course, 
often we're seeing the total alkaloid used more in traditional ceremonies, generally speaking, and the ibogaine more in clinical detox situations or th clinical therapeutic situations. Um, and and uh, there are uh, a lot of contraindicated medications and medical conditions for iboga. There's actually a broad range, and thank you for mentioning the handbook. You can go to ibogainealliance.org and get their handbook with standards of care, which is, like Patrick said, not a license to open a clinic, but a place to start. You know, we're really in the Wild West right now with learning about this medicine as it fits into what we're dealing with in the West. Um, and we need prohibition to lift so we can share information and have a standard of care. Um, so there are a lot of contraindicated medications and medical conditions, and yet many people can be medically prepared for treatment so that their experience can become much safer. You know, sometimes people are willing to chance treatment, even for, for, for example, like a substance dependency, even in the face of um, some other medical issues, but they don't know that actually a lot of people can be medically prepared. And it was talking to someone like, like Patrick or a qualified provider. So what are some of the more common contraindicated medications and medical conditions, like the, the more common, the, the big ones when it comes to iboga and ibogaine, Patrick? Mm -hmm. Okay, so with medications, let's start with that. First. That's, that's a huge, huge thing, but just as easy as I can put it, um, people ask me kind of what, what can't they take? Most mental health medications that are prescribed by a doctor are, are no go, you know? And you can always ch like say, check the Gita handbook, ask somebody who knows, like somebody who's working with the medicine who, who actually knows, right? Um, so a lot of those things are like, um, like antidepressants for one, right? And there's a broad spectrum of antidepressants, right? And those SSRIs, NSRIs, NAOs, you've got all kinds of different things like that, right? Um, you have anxiolytics, you know, to help with stress, antipsychotics. You've got like even stuff like some antihistamines and some antiarrhythmics and, you know, like HIV drugs. Uh, bipolar, schizophrenia, mood stabilizers. You know, these are contraindicated. Um, benzodiazepines, they bring along another sense of contraindication along with it as well. And some of the big things that we look at with the contraindications is this lengthening of the of prolongation of a QT interval, right? And it's the, in a nutshell, the QT interval is basically just when the heart's contracting and it stops and it starts filling back up, getting ready for another contraction to pump again and go again and repeat and repeat and repeat. And unfortunately, when you prolong it, some medications prolong that there, you know, and we come along with our medicine, Iboga, and that has a tendency to elongate the QT. Then you push it over a threshold, right? And there's certain thresholds that you can't, you don't want to go over top of and stuff like that, right? Um, so that's one point, you know, and then you've got like with the serotonin, you know, with a lot of these, these medications too, you know, they, they, um, they, they elevate the serotonin levels now. And one of the biggest things for serotonin is serotonin syndrome, right? And that's, a, and if, you, if you know anybody who's had it, it's, even if you had it a little bit, it's, it's you know, they, they talk about it as, I've never had it. I've nursed people with it and talk to people. And it's just like impending doom. You know, everything from, you get jerky movements and flushing or, or pale, your, your blood pressure goes erratic, your pulse goes erratic, you anxiety, you can have headaches, confusion, restlessness, you know, um, all these kind of things, right? And you, I, people can get dilated and whatnot, irregular heartbeats. So it's, and it, you have to be hospitalized with that. You know, so a lot of these things, you have to be careful because, you know, when you come to Iboga or Ibogaine, you're not just doing a fad plant medicine, you know, something bad. You know, this stuff is real medicine. Just like a lot of the medicine we give in the emergency room or the intensive care unit where I've done my 28 years of nursing, 
right? It's real medicine that comes along and has its own set of properties and it works really well. I mean, there's nothing wrong with Iboga or Abidine. It's not, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's what you bring along with it. So if you have a comorbidity that comes with, with you, you know, that can interfere. If you have another medication that might interfere with or interact with it, now that becomes a problem, correct? So it's really understanding how they work. And I'll repeat again, you need to ask somebody, I mean, consult, always consult with your doctor, what you're taking and things, but consult with somebody who is in this field, who is medically, professionally, who understands how they work together so you can have the proper positive reaction to it, correct? Um, so those are those some kind of those things, like benzodiazepines as well, right? So, I mean, with, with benzodiazepines, if you're on a, like doing an Ibogaine treatment, I mean, yeah, we can give you some benzodiazepines, you know, small, short-acting ones like alprazolam, you know, or things if, if you're not quite ready to start the procedure, the treatment, you know, until you get to, to the desired effect, you know. But with Iboga and using total alkaloids, you don't want to give benzodiazepines because they can end up with seizures. Correct. You know, so that's the kind of things. And, you know, so that's that's kind of like that. But, you know, there's another thing, too, is you've got with medications, you've got things like supplements and, and, and vitamin, vitamins and stuff that are just you get at the local store. Things we take for granted, like grapefruit, bergamotin. Right. You, you can't in, that interacts really profoundly with it. Coffee, caffeine, you know, uh, stimulants. Right. Um, chocolate. It can it can exacerbate the, the desired effects. And so like, even with like vitamin supplements we have at home, like, oh, I'm just taking lots of vitamins and zinc and, you know, magnesium, potassium, I'm, I'm doing good, I'm working out lots, it's great, but yet your levels are quite high and without proper testing and whatnot, it can actually be quite devastating and, and lethal. So those are some of the medications that are kind of just in a nutshell. I mean, there's so many, right? But it's always about asking and going back to where things are like some of the medical conditions that we need to watch out for when you're working with this plant medicine stuff like like uh, because iboga works on the neurotransmitters in the brain okay and it's great for neuroplasticity it's great for healing it's great for resetting it's great for uh um i say like I say it again a lot of healing in there as well but you know you have some traumatic head injuries that you can't you can't you can't uh uh, do it with it, right? You know, some organic brain syndromes and things like that, you know, whatnot. You know, really bad concussions can be controversial as well. Uh, if you've had like medical conditions like recent, any kind of recent surgery where they've had to stitch you open or, or anything, you know, you need to have like six to 12 months before you can actually do this medicine because there is a lot of purging that can happen, right? And if, even if well, my, my, my stitches are all sewn up, they're all good. They're healed, but the inside, it takes, it takes months to mesh everything back together when they go and suddenly cut inside, right? You know, things like hyperthyroid, you know, that's a real big thing. You know, we tell, tell people to take their hypothyroid medicine, the hypothyroid medications, but the hyperthyroid, be careful because it can mimic withdrawal symptoms. It can mask it so you can't see. You won't, so you're not able to be as vigilant as possible. Um, you know, some people have... Or even have are unaware that they have like heart problems, you know, like some QT uh, irregularities, you know. Um, you can have like a, a QT prolongation syndrome, where it's just you, if your body just kind of runs that way, it's a little bit longer, you know, all the time, and you wouldn't even know it. There's no signs or symptoms. It's, it's asymptomatic, so that part's it, you know. But there's a lot of other things affecting it. You know, it's like one of the syndrome called Brugada syndrome, and, it's, and with with iboga or with like even gravel, you guys would call it like Zofran as well, or things like that, or some antihistamines, it can cause an instant, instant life-threatening, you know. And that gravel, just to pause, that's a common emergency room medication. Yes. And is that right? Yeah. And so is, and you, and in, in, in the States, you know, we have gravel as much, but you have like Zofran. Mm -hmm. And on Dazatran, right? Mm -hmm. And you see that more down there in the States. But maybe you guys see it down there. I don't know. I didn't think you guys saw it much down there in gravel. But it's some of those things, right? And it's and it's you won't even know you have a problem 
And you can, you know, you can even have an EKG done. That's a scary thing here. You can have an EKG done. You get it read by a cardiologist. The doctor says, it's normal sinus rhythm. It looks good. And so you come to a clinic and if they're not, don't know how to interpret it and see it from how it's going to act with our medicine. It's not just about saying, oh, the doctor says it's good. You got to know how to read it. So how it's going to interact with our medicine. You got to look outside, see the big picture, think ahead, think outside the box for everybody. You know, it's, it's, he's doing that all the time because it can still creep up. Something can creep up as, as fast as that without knowing. So, yeah. So that's why it's important to have not only a medical professional, but a medical professional who understands this medicine because your average doctor knows nothing about this medicine. So even someone who's ACLS certified, you need to have someone who, like yourself, you know, who understands how it, how it interacts. Um, and so, yes, please go on, like some of the other medical conditions. And I'd love to get your take on Suboxone and Methadone real quick, too. We should, we should point out, too, that um, when we're talking about medications and medications mm -hmm. that people are taking that they can't just stop them. Mm -hmm. A lot of like um, medications that are for, you know, anxiety, depression, those really common ones, you can't just stop. You have to do it, you have to wean off of them and, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So we really wanna make sure that people are aware of that. And alcohol is another mm -hmm. big one. We don't think of it that way, mm -hmm. but you can't just stop drinking alcohol if you drink it regularly. We know that um, people who just even have a glass of wine uh, mm -hmm. in the evening with supper every day, Sometimes, you know, they can, if they don't have that drink, then they can go into, um, you know, withdrawal. So, mm -hmm. which is dangerous. <coughs> withdrawal from benzos and from alcohol can lead to death. So um, those are very important yeah. things that we need to be aware of and need to be asking people about before they come. Yeah, yeah. exactly that. And she was pointing at something. I'm like, what are you pointing at? <laughs> we are live here. <laughs> so, anyways, um, like so, other conditions. I mean, there's just so many things, right? You know, you want to make sure you want to make sure your heart. You, there's no heart problems, and we talked a bit about them. Lung problems, right? You know, there's a lot of lung disorders that you're not getting enough oxygen in. You're not. It's not. Your body becomes depleted with it. You, your organs start to get starved, start to not function properly. So that's a big thing. Kidneys, you know, kidneys, liver, and things like that. That's where everything gets detoxed and gets moved around, excreted, and it doesn't even get build ups, right? Like with liver, if your liver's not activated, activated properly, not working properly, then a really big thing for that is ibogaine goes into your body, into your bloodstream, and it's in the bloodstream for about an hour, you know, I've worked in ibogaine for about an hour, and it peaks in about two to four hours, but then it, <laughs> goes into the liver and in the gut wall, that's where it's converted into noribogaine, correct? So if your liver is not functioning properly, it's not going to um, get, you know, the metabolites not going to work as properly, right? And that can cause a whole lot of things. We can get into that later in here if you want or whatever. But, you know, you're, you, know you have things of lymphatic that help regulate with all your immune responses, you want to be as healthy as you can be. You don't have to be like super healthy, but as healthy, healthy as, as that's normal for you, as, as good as you can, right? Um, like you like say, I mentioned the kidneys, and, uh, bowels, bowel disease, bowel disorders, you know, because that's another part of excretion, you know, and sometimes it, you can end up having too much of it, depending if it's IBS or something else like that, or Crohn's or whatnot, or inflammation. So there's a lot of, a lot of disorders, there's a lot of, problems that can afflict us that can um, really deter whether or not we can use this medicine just like whether we can go into a surgery or, or other things so a lot of it's a lot of things to really worry about and even like with diabetes right because there's a kind of component where you're not going to be eating and then you might be fine but you might end up purging lots or other things well you know being on top of your diabetes is really important as well like it's really it can be a life-threatening thing as well and you mentioned about Suboxone and Methadone. All hail Suboxone and Methadone. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's one of those things that's, it's, you, you talk, you talk to somebody who's on it. And for the most part, they talk like it's the devil. You know, it's like these, these, these chains that bind and, 
you're just kind of, you're stuck there, you know, you've now changed in one addiction for some other addiction, they seem like, you know, it's just, it's just like, there's no end in sight. When people want to get off it, they always talk about uh, going to my doctor to get off the stuff. And he just keeps upping the medication, upping and upping and upping, you know, and, you know, when, sorry, they're sticky. Yeah, yeah, they're very sticky. Like they get, go way deep in, in, right. And I mean, originally, like I talked to a lot of uh, my doctors here, my merge doctors, and, and they're big fans of psychedelics and big fans of what we do, you know, and they talk, you know, like it's, it's really too bad. There's such a, a thing around a lot of, some, there's a lot of doctors have a certain idea of how, you know, um, these two medicines are supposed to work, right? And originally they were meant just to wean somebody off like heroin or something, something a very unstable street drug that's laced out with lots of stuff, fentanyls and things, and just bring them up to a maintenance dose and then taper them back down. And that's how originally up here was, was meant to do. But unfortunately, you get them on there and then it, they seem to just kind of forget about them. And then, you know, it, it gets to a point where it's not maintaining anymore on the level they're on. And these are some high doses sometimes, right? Of methadone, even suboxone. And um, they, they go back to street drugs or, or some behind the counter drugs or their friends or something, other prescriptions, right? And that, that's the real scary part. And that's, and so with those people often ask, well, can I come right to the, the clinic for that? Well, no, you can't come everything. You need to have you wean off those. And that takes, and they're like, they sigh, right? Because it takes a process to get off that stuff. And it's, and it's hard, man. Like Chor was saying, it was, it was a lot of work getting, getting off this stuff. And it's a lot of work. And it's, and so was Charles, right? And it's, it's, it's supposed to be a lot of work. You know, if it wasn't easy, if it was, if it was easy, it wouldn't work, you know, <laughs> simple as that, you know? It needs to be something that stops us from wanting to go back and repeat mm -hmm. some of these things. So we usually want people to be off for like for a good two months. That was my question. Yeah. yeah. Like, at a, and it's hard to say because each case is very different. It's no yeah. one is a textbook case. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. So you were saying uh, for Suboxone and Methadone. Uh, and then we have like you can talk to someone like Jonathan or myself that can help support people in their choice to transition onto something like Kratom or have vitamin therapy and IV nutrients. And um, there are some interesting things going on for people to transition and prepare safely. Um, so for Suboxone and Methadone, you think how, what's a good minimum for those? Say that again. I would want, I always ask people to be off for two months. Two months. Just because they know it's safe. It's out of their system. It gets really sticky into their bones and it just, get some leveled off, you know, because mm -hmm. they're going to have to transition to something else. Usually. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Awesome. And there's more to it. Of course, it's hard to put in a, basically like a whole week's worth of content <laughs> into this, but we want to, we want to touch on the things that, that the community can know to keep, to keep their friends safe and to be aware. So what are some of the adverse events? You know, you talked about some of the contraindications, but what are some of the adverse events that can arise in a journey or a treatment? Uh, and again, most of these can be avoided with good medical screening and good medical preparation. But just what are some of those issues that can come up both in detoxes and psycho-spiritual retreats and microdosing, which isn't well-defined, you know, even for healthy people? Yeah, so when they're going through it, I mean, there's a lot of things. You can end up with a lot of hyperemesis, so you can have electrolyte imbalances. That's the one thing you have to really watch out for. So make sure that you, you know, always make sure a person has a, has a site that you can access an IV for. You don't necessarily have to access an IV, but make sure you can find one. Some people are going to be really hard. So with hyperemesis, you have electrolyte imbalances, that's a big thing. You can have a lot of um, anxieties and panic attacks that come around. You're going to have to watch out and intervene on that um, these are just like the, just the, the normal ones but they're they're you know they're very real when you're in that moment right um you know there's there's a potential for falls all these kind of things like that because it's very toxic right you know potential for falls and that with iboga is very real you know a lot of nausea a lot of sometimes this feeling of impending doom or or uh, all these nightmares coming up you, you might even feel like some thought processes that get 
that start happening, you feel like your mind's broken sometimes, you know? So it's the despair. So a lot of things like from the mental health point of view, you have to watch out for and be able to work with people on that. Those are things that happen. They're very real. You know, you got to watch out for the person's pulses, right? The pulse can, can all of a sudden drop real low, you know? So you need to watch out for that. You don't want to go very low, you know, because then you run a risk for other things happening with the heart. Um, it, can, it can take off and go real high too. Same with the blood pressure. It can go back and forth. So you need to watch those monitors constantly. We do a head-to-toe assessment nonstop around the clock, keeping an eye on what, you know, from what the skin looks like, what it feels like, what the blood pressure looks like, what the pulse feels like, you know, what the eyes look like, uh, how their cognition is, you know, how they're responding to things, you know, what they're telling you, if they're having any pain, sometimes you can feel like a lot of pain in the stomach because mm -hmm. there's a big soul mind connection in there, you know, and a lot of stuff gets packed up in the, in, the, in the gut as well, right? You know, you need to watch out to make sure they're peeing, make sure they're they're not all of a sudden blocked up because it can be constipating a bit too. And it could be constipated coming in a little bit. You know, not everyone tells you all the truth, mm. and, you know, and they may, they may intend to, but you know, some people as you know, like Adrian would say on, on dosed is, you know, I don't have, they don't have the capacity to tell the truth sometimes, especially you know, and it's really tough, you know, especially with addiction, but even, even so if someone who's coming through just with, a psycho, psycho spiritual thing with some traumas and stuff they want so bad that they don't want to shoot themselves in the foot and not get the treatment sometimes so you know, mm -hmm. i don't know if that answered your or question enough yeah and some of the just some of the adverse events like what can happen in cardiac oh in cardiac. Yeah, yeah 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 so what can happen one of the biggest things we have to watch for so when the qt gets elongated because our med so you come you have your ekg done and it looks all good we give you our medicine, some iboga, you know, and it usually spikes the QT a little bit longer the first time. And then you give it the second ceremony and it gets a little bit longer. So you want to have it in good ranges so it stays in a good range, right? And the range is, you know, um, you don't want to, for, it's, you want between under 400, 440 is this milliseconds, right? And so every time you, it gets higher and higher and higher, the uh, threshold's a little higher for women than this for men. It's about 450 for men, 470 for women. But if it hits over 500, then you can end up with something called trissades, you know, and your heart's just going bang, 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 bang. It's getting attacked from all angles, you know, and from there you end up with a cardiac arrest and death. You know, that's a big one. There's a lot of other things too that can happen when your heart gets down too low with a very, very bradycardic, very slow, right? And then, and it involves pacing and going to the hospital for that. So a lot of things like are that way there. Mm -hmm. And and the imbalances too, sorry, the imbalances from electrolytes that can just kind of slip away on you. You don't even realize this person's not been drinking enough while they're at, at your center, say, or even before, right? They start getting deliriums and delusion. They can have like seizure-like fits, all these kind of things that are really life-threatening potentially. And the confusional and delusional state where someone is completely disconnected from reality, that, that can happen. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to know, uh, well, especially in detoxes, mm -hmm. you know, where people are so disoriented and, and can be literally unmanageable. Mm -hmm. So it takes someone, a team that's really prepared for that. Um, Jonathan, I'd love to hear from you your thoughts on microdosing and why, you know, why the, the unique considerations and dangers there, maybe as people are getting a cavalier in their, in their self-dosing, um, what are some of the things we need to be careful of with that? Thank you, Patrick. Sure. Well, I mean, to back up a little bit, a couple of you mentioned the, <clears throat> the guidelines that we put together. Um, which you can find, it's, I think it's ibeganalliance.org slash guidelines. I put the link in the chat there. Um, so, I mean, the, the goal with it was to say, look, there's definitely risks that are involved, but um, a lot of times people that are coming to do Ibogain are have overcome some level of, <laughs> of fear of taking risks. Um, or are living a risky lifestyle in general. So, um, so we had to acknowledge when we put that together, like people aren't going to 
um, ever end up, like you said, in a textbook scenario where it's perfectly safe. But here are, given these risks, here are how we can manage them. So I think with, with microdosing, the, the thing is you, you get QT prolongation from ibogaine, and then there's also some studies that are showing that nor ibogaine, which ibogaine gets converted into, um, also prolongs the QT interval. So, and that if you're taking ibogaine on a regular basis, will <clears throat> accumulate at least over days, or I don't know how long exactly, but um, at least over days. So, um, and I think that just looking historically at it, I think um, that the death with the lowest dose that I've heard of was something like 300 milligrams of ibogaine, which isn't it isn't a huge amount. It's not it's not like a proper microdose. But um, but it's it's a booster, you know. So, I mean, I have the benefit of most of the people that I end up working with have already been through treatment and been through and been cleared and whatever. So um, I think, like for myself, because I have access to it, even when I'm microdosing, I go and I have my blood checked and I get EKGs because it's easy to do. And I think if it's available to you, it just makes so much sense to do it especially if you're able to, I don't know if there's something that Patrick does, or you can find somebody that will help you interpret it, that knows about it. I think it's a really strong, a really strong step because we don't know um, at what dose, um, at what small of a dose, you know what I mean? You're going to start to have that, uh, that effect or that, um, that risk build up. So, I mean, that's my recommendation. For it. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. So it builds up and uh, and and it can be wise to have all the medical screening that you would for a flood dose, also for microdosing. So if you're planning on microdosing, the consensus uh, and Patrick, you know, uh, feel free to to add on this, but the consensus amongst really experienced medical experts in this is is to get all of the same medical screening. And if you intend to microdose, go work with a really qualified seasoned provider first and have a, have a higher dose under supervision. And then you have a relationship. Um, and even then we wanna be mindful about how it accumulates in our bodies and stay checking in on ourselves. Um, Just add to it quickly yeah. too. Um, because usually microdosing or low dose protocols, like if you were on earlier and you heard Claire talking about like taking, like stepping people down, that involves taking medicine over a period of time. And I know that Claire and other people who use that protocol are doing EKGs regularly throughout it. So if you are a micro, it's not just about getting cleared at the beginning, but it's understanding that there, it's a change that builds up. So, you know, staying in contact with somebody that knows about it and, and continuing to be safe with it. Is a good idea. Yeah. So we're talking about stepping down where we're giving people lighter doses, not a big flood dose or ceremonial dose, uh, lighter doses, and then having a slow step down and release from something that they're letting go of, like heroin. Uh, but the tricky part is that this is a, a high art. <laughs> you know, this is very careful and there can be there can be points in that where it can get dangerous. So having someone like Claire uh, or, and Patrick uh, and some special people we know is, is invaluable. So, so some of the medical screening that any what, good yeah. provider I, should sorry, do. I, sorry, can I just chime in? I, one little Absolutely. thing about the microdosing. Um, I mean, I agree with everything. Just it's something I, it's not a sort of recommendation. It's just, um, at some point, microdosing can't replace, you know, good old fashioned hard work, right? Some people think, well, I'm just going to keep, like, I know they asked, it's one of the things they asked Adrian in the movie, you know, you know, it looks like you're just replacing one thing with another. So really, are you, are you broken free from anything? Well, sure. Sure you have, right? But, you know, just be aware of your intentions when you're going in to do your microdosing, right? You know, you don't want it to become a crutch that you're just relying on. Oh, I got to go back and do this again and go back and do this again, right? You know, you want to instead, like you want to further your journey 
and use the microdosing as a tool. That's what it is, it's just a tool. It's not, that's all it is, right? And it's not a permanent net for a permanent solution. And it shouldn't have to be, you shouldn't have to be on anything. But it's one of those things that being said, you know, the use of, of microdosing can definitely prove beneficial in aiding the process, right, of your journey until the one day you can walk on your own because that's what we all want to do. We all want to get up and walk on our own without training wheels anymore. But knowing that we can come back and visit occasionally and, and ask medicine and talk, right? And so that's just one thing, because I know some people think, well, I'm gonna microdose every day and it's gonna be, you know, I don't take care anymore, I can just do it, no big deal. Well, it doesn't really work that way. You know, I see Jonathan smiling, so, <laughs> you know. But it's, it's just as a consideration I wanted to add, because it's one of the things I hear from a lot of people. And that's it's an important thing, I think, to understand. And I think you can say that too, even with, you know, taking the big doses because we have had clients that say, well, I need to come back every three months because it only <laughs> works for three months and then I'm back to my addiction or whatever. So it's this sort of like you not using, like you've said earlier, the medicine in that, with that respect that, you know, just because the medicine has taught you or is coming into you and helping you and releasing you through some of those things doesn't mean it releases you from all your own obligations to continue moving forward and, and working on yourself. Vasi, so, yeah. Vasi, as we say in Africa, absolutely yes. Uh, we don't wanna be colonists of the medicine. We don't wanna be passive consumers. We want to offer of ourselves as much as we ask and translate a, that into planetary healing, right? Whoop, whoop. So, so what are some of the minimal medical screening tests for flood doses and if you're intending to microdose? Uh, and again, that's with a medical provider who understands the interaction with the, with the medicine. Um, Patrick, you wanna share the minimal medical screening? I sure do. <laughs> So really important, you need to get some lab work done, right? So you want full CBC, right? Complete blood count. You want electrolytes, which include calcium, magnesium, potassium, right? You want some hepatic and renal panels. So it's your liver and kidney panels involved in that. There is a one phenotype, was it site 450-2D6? Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, that's looks, shows, works about um, with the uh, ibogaine or ibogaine metabolite as well. So those are some of the tests for the lab work that you need to have. It's important to know how the heart's working, how things the body is affecting everything, right? And then of course the EKG have to, and it's, you know, I get a lot of times people get bring EKGs and you need to have them done really by and read by a cardiologist, you know, not just have it unconfirmed, you know, mm -hmm. and, even when it's by a cardiologist, it's it it just it's it can say normal sinus rhythm and everything look fine. But then you have someone who knows how our medicine works. That's key. We, I don't I don't interpret it like a, a cardiologist would, but I can interpret it from our medicine point of view to see if it's safe to work with our medicine. And you can see whether or not things are lining up because our medicine works has a lot of different characteristics. So those are some big ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thanks. And I'd love to hear so people know some of the physiological experiences and psychological experiences that that people have with the medicine, both in detoxes and psycho-spiritual treatments. What is it like? Like just describe kind of and Charles, why don't you jump in? I haven't heard from you yet. Just some of the sensations or experiences in a journey, physically, mentally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the most common things that comes on is the auditory hallucination. That's usually the first, the first thing that people notice is the buzzing, um, the frequency. And it can feel, it can sound like bees. It can feel like you also are vibrating with it. So your body oftentimes feels as if it's vibrating or starting to float. That's also very common, which is interesting because you're, you're also losing control or you're, you're losing control of your, mus uh, your muscles, like Patrick mentioned, the ataxia. So there is a dissociative effect happening as well. Um, and then visually speaking, 
you know, that's, everyone has a different, has a different experience there. And not everyone experiences visions with Ibogaine Boga, I would say it's probably, probably, uh, probably the minority actually experience visual, um, some sort of visual component to their experience. And me personally, I never have had anything of, of significant impact visually. Um, I know chore you have and, and other people have as well. I keep trying, I'm going to keep trying for it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, one thing that really stands out for me, yeah, one thing that stands out for me from my experience and, uh, you know, other people's experiences, there's this, there's this fastness that starts happening in the inner dialogue, your mind and your own experiencing starts moving at a very rapid pace. And it's, it's hard, it can feel, as I said, it can feel exhaustive, it can feel as if you're being pummeled, either by yourself or by the medicine, and you can't catch up. And this can really overwhelm you to the point where it does force you to surrender, which I think is a big aspect of why it's so valuable because your mind goes, goes, goes until it just clears. And as Jonathan mentioned, it, that clear mind state that you get from Iboga or Ibogaine, and especially afterwards, is really, I think, such a profound opportunity um, because it just feels like everything is new and it the first time you've ever experienced anything is right then and that is a that's a really special and profound experience for a lot of people and in my work at the clinics and we have a lot of providers here who have much more experience than me and have been able to be with people's processes much more but as I've seen, you know, people come out of the experience, they feel renewed, they feel refreshed, they feel like a new person. And, and I did as well. And then, you know, it's like, okay, what do you do now? And that's where the work comes in. And so I think, um, you know, I think I'll, I'll say one thing and, and Chor could probably talk a lot about this more, but as far as the, the visions, um, you know, this life review that happens. I mean, I've heard things where people have been able to view their entire life in a timeline and see all the things that have happened to them. Sometimes they'll have one, one thing that comes up and just keeps looping on them, one experience that just keeps looping. And sometimes those visions can be directed. I know within the Bwiti work and, and some of the work that I've done there and, and other people here are more experienced in that, they can actually guide your process. So I'm gonna throw it to you, Chor. You explain now. I just cut that one, all right. Okay, do a Hail Mary there. Um, Elizabeth wants to take it there with the visual experience of Iboga. Well, let me, let me. Um, or any, any physical or mental <clears throat> experiences me, what you go through let me add something to you know the the purpose of iboga one of the one of the major factors and purposes of iboga is like it's like it's like fighting fire with fire so um usually people are coming in with traumatic experiences and it seems like it takes a traumatic experience to break a traumatic experience so when you go within especially with iboga you're 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 facing these traumatic experiences to where they seem like this is this is traumatizing to where it breaks that traumatic experience and at the end of that experience it's like you're freaking walking on water that's what it feels like levitate whatever you want to call it but um when it comes to the visual experience of, of, of this medicine. Um, I can just I can just share my experience with you when it comes to meeting my ancestors. So um took some iboga with the Buiti brother of mine and we went deep into ceremony and from there you know we, we were having a fire talk you know it's a traditional fire ceremony and 
his the topic was ancestors and he was like basically let's go in and um find our ancestors and try to try to connect with our ancestors or he was advising me to and so I laid down went in uh medicine wasn't really kicking in that much and then he gave me another ta which is a total alkaloid uh extraction of of iboga and he gave me another one after that one like i said earlier beat me up scotty i was gone blast off um i basically screamed out screamed out with him or my soul did screamed out within talking about i want to see my ancestors bring my ancestors to me all of a sudden some pyramid like shape broke out of the darkness and in my visions if you read in elizabeth's book or if you haven't read elizabeth's book i'm a uh uh superhero uh named love man call myself love man have a heart on my chest and everything shoot out hearts hearts coming out of the third eye hearts coming out of the heart killing all the negative darkness forces around me flying up to the top of this pyramid on top of this pyramid, I'm looking in the center of it, and there's this uh, like 12 foot tall, like a Bwiti shaman with his hands up to the sky, with a beam of light shooting from his hands. Granted, this is this is the this is a visual experience. This is my visual experience of this medicine. Like Charles said earlier, this could it could be different for anybody, but. He had this beam of light shooting through his hands. From there, I'm like looking at him, observing him closely. It's like he, um, his skin was made of stars. Just the universe was, was in his skins with bright eyes and big smile. And um, I'm like looking at him like, like, what does he have in his hands? What the hell does he have in his hands? And all of a sudden he's, uh, he looks at me, smiles, and brings it down and makes this one of the most beautiful this sounds like I'd never heard these this auditory, this sound ever in my life. Never. I only hear these sounds when I when I'm with I with that when I'm with the medicine I book. Um brings it down. I look into his hands, and there's like a live beating heart in his hands. Just live and direct. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a freaking heart in his hands. And, and so I just got back from Africa uh, doing a rite of passage and initiation, as Jonathan was talking about earlier, which is another profound experience. Um, imagine dancing on tons of iboga in order to be initiated into this tradition. That's what you have to do with this medicine with this tradition, with the Bwiti, hands down. Um, from there, you have to think quick on your feet. Quick on your feet, think quick, think quick. So I grabbed the heart, I said, okay, I grabbed the heart. And he like looks at me and he says, now what are you going to do with it? <laughs> I said, oh shit, okay, back from Africa. I'm Bwiti now. I'm like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I freaking open up my chest like a board game. Seeing everything live and direct, wet, guts, everything, heart. I mean, lungs, everything. And then all of a sudden, there was like no heart here. It was just a dark cloud, which I call the nothing that, that um, is the darkness within. It was just right on the heart area. And so I said, well, this is what I'm going to do with that. I popped the heart right in there and just felt the connections physically in physical time and in, um, in the spirit world. I felt the, it was like an electrical, electric surge just connecting. Like I just like came back home and then that music just enhanced even more and just it's like, boom, you're coming back home. 
and the bright light shined up in front of me like the sun. So one of my, my traditional name is uh, Nyangu, which means the sun, Kombe Manzambe. Um, so the sun appeared before, before me and I reached into it. Something told me to reach into it, just reach into it, pulled out this, I don't know, it was like a grail or something. It was like the first cup ever, but it wasn't like a fancy cup, it was just like wooden or something like that. It had this crazy liquid in it, like gold sun liquid. And it just said, pour it on the heart. So I poured it on the heart and I felt that molding to the heart, just turning the heart into gold. That's why within some, within my pieces after that, my artwork, I've always incorporated hearts of gold. So from there, I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And it's just like, I, I just came back home, closed the board game, gave thanks to the ancestors, shot off out into the cosmos and kept doing some more work. And that's what we do. Thank you, babe. So they, yeah, they can be they can yeah. be pretty crazy, pretty crazy, pretty good stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, they can. Awesome, They're very profound, very Ro profound. That's Ro just uh, that's just that's just that's just that one just, scenario. That was only that's five minutes. Five minutes of ten hours. <laughs> yeah. So just to add yeah. a, a little a little bit uh, to that, and then we'll move into social impact and sustainability. A uh, couple more medical questions and to throw in that um, in addition, and, and thank you for presencing the auditory hallucinations, Charles. This is really interesting when people start to hear things and often it's a reflection of something going on in their psyche too. So a lot of people don't realize that's a piece of it. Uh, and, uh, and I'll add in that the puking, you know, the puking, this, this is the most strongly purgative medicine I've experienced. I, I probably purged seven times my first time and very hard purging. So like Patrick said, with the surgeries or, or even some heart issues, right? Like the force of the purging can be so intense. I've almost aspirated myself in Africa on the most intense tea I've ever had. And, and it, it's a skill set that navigating the the intense purging i've seen people really really struggle with the purging and when i was purging i felt though i i didn't come to the medicine for a a strong drug dependency i came for trauma and ptsd but as i was purging i felt all of the toxic biochemicals that accumulate in the tissues coming out of me from fear and stress cortisol adrenaline these are real things that accumulate and have an effect and that was that was beautiful and it was very difficult and i'll add too that it can get worse before it gets better with a lot of issues including psychological issues and trauma and pain neuroses and what we see as providers is that when people in in the especially the beginning stages where things are amplified the neuroses will get amplified the confusion, the paranoia. We've seen people get very paranoid oh, at times. Yeah, yeah it, it, fantastic stories of that. So at first, the neuroses is amplified and the intelligence in that is that a provider can really, it's like looking under a microscope where we can really see, oh, you know, oh, they're stuck in perfectionism or, you know, there's this, there's this fear of other people, like things come up that we can start to see at first. That's why having a great connection with your provider and really feeling good and a deep trust is really key. And, and knowing all this may or may not happen. So different, such a dynamic medicine, visions, no visions. Um, so before we roll into the social impact and sustainability, short, hopefully short question, what are some of the dangers from mail ordering medicine uh, and social dangers too? So literal dangers, social dangers. Jonathan, you want to jump in? Um, sure. I think, well, I mean, Patrick already talked a bunch about why it's important to do medical screening. 
Um, and I think one of the things that we didn't talk about is just the contra, or not, not the contraindication, but just the way that Ibogaine interacts with opiates and other drugs that people are trying to come off of. So like a lot of times when I've seen people ordering medicine, it's because they're trying to detox themselves at home and they're looking at the cost of the clinic, like that's prohibitive, you know? And so trying to find a way to still be able to do it. And I think one of the big challenges aside from not being able to do all that screening is just not really knowing how to do the process well and um, you know prepare for it time the <laughs> time the doses really understand the arc of what they're going through and have somebody to kind of hold them in that and let them know where they are and all that so um, I mean that's that's very specific to a lot of the people that I work with but um, you know I think yeah, I think it's uh, it's like I said, it's a risky thing to do. People are used to used to taking risks, and I think it's just really good to at least understand what that risk is that you're that you're taking. Really make sure you understand what it is. Yeah, absolutely, and that's that's some of the the issues that can come up in in a home treatment. And also, I'll just add there's a lot of medicine online that has been adulterated that's been found to be laced with fentanyl that's from the wrong cardiotoxic plant that uh, is not strong enough to do a detox. You know, iboga has to be mature enough as a plant to a certain point to create medicine strong enough for a detox. And then we have the difference between factory farm iboga you know, coming out of Cameroon and wild jungle grown, that's old plants that's been harvested sustainably and ceremonially. And and, and there's a a sacredness with all that. So the frequency and the intelligence of the medicine makes a big difference how it's grown and how it's treated and the ecosystem that it's from. And in addition, elephant poachers. You want to speak to that, Jonathan, just that relationship? Um, sure. I mean, when I first started organizing in the Ibogaine community, it was in 2012, I did a, a conference, and it was sort of the first time where I heard that big download of sort of what was going on um, there in Gabon. And, you know, it included the the price had gone up in local markets so it made it very difficult for people to be able to access like, traditional practices um and that because of that increase of price it had you know incentivized people to go out and try to um find it to sell and to to ship um, but the people who were had most access to it was people who were already doing poaching because elephants eat iboga fruits. And then so, you know, they crap out the seeds while they're walking down elephant trails. And so they're, they're on the same path. So that was, um, you know, part of the news that we were getting that there'd been sort of even like really dramatic pictures of ivory and, and iboga plants like together. Um, when arrests were made and stuff by forest rangers. So, I mean, to, to what extent um, it was supporting that trade, I have no idea what to say, really. It, it's really hard to, to know or understand what is going on. But for me, like, I know a lot of people around psychedelics have talked about how it has some benefit for like it helps you feel like you can connect with nature you know and even even further down the line maybe it has some potential to increase our environmental awareness and so for me going to Gabon and seeing and feeling like what it was like not just like the importance of being there but what it was like to have such a profound relationship with the medicine and like there was a, a pygmy community that we went to and they said look the 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 stuff in the forests is for the ancestors. And what they would do is go and pick the, the fruits and then plant closer to the village. And it was the, the plants that had grown up closer to the village with the people kind of that, you know, people had watched grow as they grew um, that they were using for their initiations. So that kind of level of relationship with the plant was just really, really inspiring. 
Um, I don't think any of us have that. I know, I know some people have started to try to grow it um, and all of that themselves as well. But um, I think it's at least really important to think about the relationship with the plant and where it comes from. Because like you said earlier, we partner with the plant you know, when we're doing that work, not only like internally, but also in the external world, in the physical world, we're, we're in partnership with it. So we want to make sure that we're in a good and whole relationship with that. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. So as we all know, uh, or we're learning together, iboga and ibogaine are not a magic pill for curing addiction or trauma is one piece to the puzzle. It is within a holistic picture and that can involve gut health and functional medicine and community and expressive arts and communication skills and life skills and uh, just all of the pieces. Um, So I'd love to hear from you, whoever feels inspired of the speakers to jump on, just very laser-like, some things that have helped you integrate or the medicine, or hold the medicine work, um, or uh, the frameworks, right? Just helpful context. What makes the the bigger container for good medicine work with iboga and ibogaine? How about Charles? You're right there. I see you. Go. Um, yeah. So I, my experience coming off of opiates was. I remember the first thing was exercise, like my body, my physical body being connected to my physical body and strengthening my physical body was bar none, the most valuable thing I could do immediately after my experience. Uh, I didn't, at that time, I didn't have any of the tools I have now. I didn't know about meditation. I didn't know who to talk to. So I would say the two things that were really stood out to me was exercise and then getting involved. As soon as I finished my treatment, I said, this is what I want to do. And so I just started to work on helping other people do that and started to work on developing clinics. So I, I kind of skipped, uh, you know, I jumped to the, the community support feature and just started to find people that I could help and started to call up friends and family members and take them to Mexico to get treated. And so that was, that was a big thing for me was the evangelistic capacity that I had for the medicine because of what I went through. Um, I was, you know, they say after you have your experience, you're in somewhat of a pink cloud. And I utilize that to go and and share with other people. And so, you know, advocacy was a big supporting factor for me. Um, So I'll just use those two. I mean, there's many other things, but those two stand out. Basi. David and Mia, you're right there. You, is there anything you'd like to contribute to that? Yeah, um, you know, definitely. I think you know, meditation, exercise, and advocacy. That's you know, service. Uh, those are very grounding, and um, you can you know really integrate. I think a lot. You know, honor the experience, and I think a lot. What you're saying about it, there's no magic pill. Um, you know, it's really about the intention, and I think Patrick probably are alarming Mia's dad quite a bit with the. Plenty of contraindications and all, all the care. I mean, it's all very important. But I think it, what it leads to is because this is such serious medicine that the medicine starts working in the you know, month, even months before, because you got to clean out. You got to get your get right. You know, if you want to like come into the medicine and I watch that with a friend and and just you know just really can you know you get your diet right, you get your exercise. You know, and the more you kind of put in that intention and work, the more I think you get out of the medicine. And then it does open that window of opportunity, but you got to take advantage of it. You got to you got to then do the work. And if you don't, it'll just fall back. And um, so yeah. So I think uh, I also have maybe the other side of that is while it's immensely important to have deep respect for the medicine and and to know what you're going into and to have um, support that has knowledge about the medicine. The other side of that I think is the respect for the self and the uniqueness of the uniqueness of the experience for everybody. And um, that, you know, going in and doing that work inside, like that's you, 
doing that, you know, and no one can do that work for you. So um, being supported by our facilitators to prepare for it, to ask questions for myself, um, to even being guided, you know, that that was such a an incredible gift, you know, um, to accomplish some of the things that I had wanted to to accomplish and ask. Um, and beyond that, you know, coming home and dropping back in, writing, um, having people to mm. share my story with, you know, and having having time to keep reflecting, you know, it, uh, right after it's so intense, you know, it takes a lot of time to understand and to, to continue letting that unfold. Um, and um, yeah. Yeah, that respect and, and, and so trusting yourself, you know, the, the deep part of my experience also was connecting with my own soul, you know, that the chore has his own story of that and many people have different versions of what it's like to meet your soul. My soul was my five year old self, you know, and she had all of the answers for me, and was so confident and to reform that trust with myself, and to know that I was this pure and innocent and strong creature with all of these answers that I could go to and return to was um incredibly valuable Basi, absolutely beautiful thank you for sharing that Shore boogie painted a bunch of things like like this little sweet spirit Shore, what helped you to really hold the medicine work in a good way because it's not just the medicine it's it's how we hold it um I'd have to say that when it comes to the when it comes to you yourself after 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 the fact after the medicine, um, I, it's it's it, it's not hard. It's it's not complicated. I think we just tend to complicate things and make things complicated. So it's like uh, me myself personally, I had to trust myself in order to look, trust myself in order to want to change my life, need to change, not want, need to change my life and, and, and take my life in a whole different direction, like do different things, do new things. Um, meditation, like you would never fucking think that I, uh, meditate, what the hell is that? So, you know, I started going down that path, you know, in the beginning until I realized that, man, I've been meditating this whole time just by painting for 10, 12 hours. So technically I'm, I'm meditating for 10 or 12 hours straight. Um, so that's my form of meditation. So technically that could be one aspect that has helped, helped my integrative process. Um, health, definitely health, physical health is, is key. You know, I, uh, went down the paths of, or I'm still in the path of, a you know, a form of self-discipline when it comes to like Krav Maga. So it's like, Going down this path, choosing a path to go down that 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 you, that you want to have a respect and love for, and embracing it, and honing in on that path, and technically it's it's it or basically it's it's self discipline, learning and embracing the self discipline. You know, see before before the fact before I did iboga, I was ten years clean off heroin and instead of telling myself that I fucked up I went back in the lesson so um learning these lessons basically basically is like is what what iboga has helped with with that integrative process and 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 knowing the lesson before it even before it even hits you and and understanding overstanding understanding overstanding and understanding that lesson before it even before it even comes to your doorstep and then once you're once you're able to to realize this then you can ah that's not for me that's not for me Especially if you're coming from a from an addictive personality. Um, that's that's basically, you know, that's it. You know, self discipline. 
learning, learning and, and understanding and overstanding and understanding self-discipline. Yeah, thank you. Basi. Oh, Basi. Basi, thank you. And uh, I see we got some questions. So if you jumped on late, we will be taking questions at a point. Uh, we're going to speak a little more on sustainability, and then we'll open up for some questions from people. So you can type questions in the chat box. And um, Patrick and Michelle, was there anything else you wanted to add to to that? Or should we roll roll on? I can just add one little thing: is just to remember that you know life sets back in. People leave uh, an iboga and I begin experience feeling good like sometimes better than they've ever felt and they feel like that feeling could never leave but you know when you go home and the problems that maybe you haven't been facing are still there and you have to deal with them so be kind to yourself to you know realize that it's 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 all it's all okay that it's okay to take time and yeah that was my thought Bessie, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. It, what's that, Jonathan? The integration Go ahead. piece. Please. So, I mean, for me, um, even, like when I do smaller doses of Ibogaine too, I, like, I, I don't know if we've mentioned it too, but in smaller doses, it can be quite stimulating and give you a lot of energy. So, definitely, like physically moving has been um, really important. But, um, you know, the one thing that kind of saved my life like like for me doing the initiation took everything apart in my life and i had to put it back together and the one thing that i was able to find because it's everywhere and it's a solid structure was 12-step programs and i know that not everybody has the same experience with that but um but for me that was really huge um and then you know there's other kinds of ways trying to find that fellowship around the medicine even if it isn't like you know that you can't be like charles and go and open in clinics or whatever um one of them i do every right now we're doing them weekly but we do um uh once a week meetings just for people that have taken ibogaine it's a lot of people that have been through detox programs and so we're working based off of smart recovery um format and using those tools but um, but yeah, finding those kinds of groups and people to connect with and community around it can be really helpful. Awesome. Yeah, I see some, I uh, appreciate that. Yes, uh, we need to, the continuing inventory and community and support, and we'll get to those questions shortly. Thank you, great questions coming in. Thanks, Juliana and Rebecca. Um, David and Mia, so, so our healing is, is not isolated from the world. Our healing is so connected. So here's a place to start. Why is it important for our global social safety to support sustainable and fair trade ibogaine production and, and the indigenous Bwiti communities? Yeah. You know, you know part of the, in my ibogaine vision, uh, at one point I like, saw the beauty of the peyote tradition. And I think in part just because I was getting such a download on the ritual, but really saw like the healing power of this tradition for the Malays of the Western kind of disease, uh, colonial mindset and disconnection and alienation from nature. And, um, and, I, and similarly in ayahuasca, I've seen the, the same, like the, you know, the blood running from a genocide and just the like, sixth grade extinction event. And, you know, but then this is beautiful medicine and tradition coming to heal the you know, that what's, what's so out of balance and wrong in the world. So the boga, you know, I think, you know, in, in all these, in, in every one of these plant medicine traditions, like there's just something just incredibly powerful and, um, you know, generations, thousands of years of, of holding in the highest ceremonial way and container to preserve and not destroy and exploit with all the capitalistic extractive kind of things. And so now is demand for all these medicines is now starting to really rise. You know, there's a lot of, there's just all kinds of threats for all of the medicine. And um, so, you know, just really getting to know Elizabeth and Chor and then Ben from Ice Years and the sustainability issues of, um, around Iboga. And, you know, and then like realizing, okay, like if we can 
meet the demand of ibogaine in a sustainable way and it remove the kind of detox pressure off the medicine in Gabon. And, and so in Jonathan as well um, has been doing a lot of work in this. So they, you know, I was just getting educated um, in, and like all kinds of agricultural commodities, it's somewhat similar story or the same story of, of corporate industrial agriculture, just kind of coming in and displacing small, you know, beautiful community of smallholder farmers um, and displace them off their land to become plantation workers for slave wages and, and these ecologically destructive you know, conditions. And so with Bronner's, all our supply chains have unique stories, like our coconut, it's, you know, we don't buy just from brokers with no visibility of what's going on. We've made sure that we understand the farming communities are buying from. So coconut oil from Sri Lanka and Samoa and beautiful stories. And, um, our olive oil comes from Palestine and Israel, 90% from the Palestinian side, and it's really cool, smallholder, regenerative organic project. But then in Ghana, we get our palm oil. So Ghana is the heart, historical, uh, you know, biological home for palm. And palm is one of the most destructive crops generally as it's grown. Um, the rainforest in Indonesia and Borneo is being ripped up, communities displaced, orangutan habitat destroyed. But there's nothing inherently bad about palm. It actually can be very regenerative if it's grown right. So in Ghana, we're actually intercropping palm. We work with like a thousand farmers intercropping palm, cocoa, banana, and cassava. And that's like tall trees, middle level trees and, and ground cover. And it's multi-strata ag forestry or dynamic ag forestry and showing how you can really do a regenerative type biodiverse, very productive farming system, you know, replicating nature. And anyway, so I guess Jonathan pumped us up about Vokanga, this, this variety that makes a precursor to Ibogaine. That's a, it's a different, you know, rather than Niboga, and it's, um, and it's another route to producing and meeting the Ibogaine demand. And I guess it grows all around Ghana, Cameroon, and Gabon as well. So we're now looking to intercrop that with the, basically as another crop, in, in Ghana and become and <clears throat> potentially supply the South African Ibogaine manufacturer. But just, you know, not that we're gonna have a single answer to all this, but like just be an example of like here, this is how you could do it you know, in a way that that's awesome and you know, kind of have have a kind of cool, sustainable, sweet um, origin story for Ibogaine. Um, and then in Gabon proper, um, we, we're not, look, well, we don't know exactly how we can be helpful, but one of the ways is that the, there's this guru of dynamic ag forestry and, and we've, at some point this year, um, our team wants to go visit Gabon, um, maybe when Elizabeth and Chor are in there and, you know, to see kind of what the projects are on the ground. I think Jonathan knows uh, some, some of the main ones um, and just see, you know, how can we be helpful potentially and be awesome to, enable the you know BT to benefit from a sustainable production system and you know choose to supply on their terms you know other you know the non-indigenous um and benefit and be able to spread the wealth in a really cool sustainable fashion you know we're looking at that for peyote medicine as well and in, in texas and in mexico and yeah I just want to quickly acknowledge um, the generosity that there has been around Iboga from the Bushmen to um, the, the Gabonese or to the Bwiti and from the Bwiti to these initiates and from these initiates to novices like myself and David. And so to connect that cycle of generosity and, and restore that, that balance and gratitude so that we can keep continue learning from each other and continue sharing this medicine with our brothers and sisters. Thank you so much. So we're seeing a bigger picture approach of sourcing ibogaine from this other plant, Volkanja or Volkanga, uh, also in making that fair trade. Yeah. You know, really clear and transparent and being in relationship. I get that a lot. Medicine loves relationships, like being in relationship with the indigenous communities that really know this medicine intimately from eons this is it's rocket fuel you can take a bunch of rocket fuel and 
pour it on a pile of garbage and burn up the garbage, or you can take a trip around the galaxy, mm -hmm. right? And they know about the galaxy. So let's be in communication and, and, and many, not all, but like the communities that we know want visitors. They want to share their knowledge and be in a good way, be in a fair way. And there's a lot going on in Gabon right now with, uh, with exploitation of the, of the earth's resources there and taking out all the sacred trees. And a lot of the young people are heading to Libreville to get these kind of menial jobs and they're having cultural degradation. Um, so they they want the guests, you know, that would help a lot with those that are open. And Jonathan, do you want to jump into this just with being in good relations with Gabon and what they're dealing with, with like um, Nagoya, if you'd like? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know how much to add. I, I think it's a complicated thing to go. It's um, It's a complicated place to go and travel and you know, there's a there's a language barrier, but just like a really profound uh, barrier, not not necessarily a barrier, but just like a difference of worldview that's hard to even understand what the impact is of being there, or <laughs> um, you know, being in relationship is. So, um, but definitely, like when I went, I was responding to an invitation to go, um, and I know that others have have done the same and so you know i think following um you know, following that i think if you were looking to go it would be looking at places that were really well established to receive foreigners or people who have experience going there um and could kind of coach you about what it's like and you know what your intention is and what you're hoping to get out of it and what could be reciprocal about it um, yeah, that's just on a personal level with Nagoya. I don't know, um, you know, on a, I don't know if you want to get into like the bigger political issues about that. But. Oh, I guess we should cap it and be like, well, there's bigger political issues and, and, and movements to protect Iboga, but also then that limits how certain indigenous communities want to share. Uh, and there's different viewpoints within Gabon. So we're working through it. But I, I think a really key piece is creating sustainable fair trade ibogaine that will lower the global price point, you know, or help to contribute to that conversation. Um, that would be really helpful. So we're getting there. We have some questions. We'll wrap it up. It's been a long evening. I want to thank everyone for sharing your wisdom and your experience and bringing your kind attention here. Um, and just to a respond to Rebecca. Thank you for your question about, you know, she asked um, the medical complications that were discussed. Are those regarding ibogaine alone or iboga as well? Definitely both. Uh, and, and in slightly different ways, but definitely both. And are the contraindications and potential medical dangers present in the same way to the same degree with both? Um, so very, very close. And I have heard, Patrick, what's your take on this, that ibogaine is actually a little bit harder on the heart, like a little bit more of a cardiac impact. Have you noticed that as well in your experience um, being in both kinds of scenarios? Um, I would say if, if, it, if it is, it would only be in the way that it's – that. Um, in the way it's um, being given, and it's high, yeah, it's higher dose. Yeah, the way the ceremony's going and everything else, it's more concentrate for one, the, the ibogaine. So you have to be really careful with that part of it because you can end up with a, quite a lot in your system. So, yeah. But both all these con you know, all these adverse events and different things are um, applicable to both, especially in high amounts, and and we don't. Our intention is is not to make people fearful, but just to learn how to come to the medicine in a safe way and uh, talk to Patrick. <laughs> you can reach out. There's some amazing people in the world who know a lot about how to come to medicine in a safe way, like like Claire, who's on on the call here that we'd love to bring into a future call, and others who have a lot of experience, like the the people. There's some people on this call with a lot of experience. Uh, so to be continued.
with sharing more and more. It's just all about having the right support and getting the right screening and really knowing your body. Um, and then Juliana had a really great question. Juliana, uh, she said, I want to ask about a different kind of safety. What about abusive practitioners who treat clients abusively, especially male practitioners on female clients? I would like to bring up ideas for how to deal with this in our community because it comes up constantly. Um, and, and absolutely, this is a big deal. That, and also, this is a big problem with prohibition. Prohibition, the, often people who have been uh, victimized don't feel safe to go to law enforcement or to even talk about it. And even in the countries uh, of origin, uh, sometimes the law enforcement isn't willing to help or available to go into certain communities. So that's a big problem. People get abused financially. People get abused sexually. People get um, abused in any way that's, that's not their own soul's agenda. You know, if something is being pushed that is not their soul's agenda, that's not okay. And we're in this global learning curve and need to talk about ethics more and more. Juliana, do you want to jump on and just share your thoughts in a minute or two? Um, sure. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, there's just a pattern of abuse that keeps coming up in the community where you hear these harrowing stories from female clients. And because, you know, I, I begin clinics operate in this gray area where there's no way to monitor them, there's no way to certify them. Um, so not only are so many clinics unsafe medically, but they're unsafe, like emotionally and physically for many people. And um, there's practitioners working right now who I heard about have reported rapes last month and they're still operating. So it's like, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to hold them accountable? And also there's another issue of um, male males in the community who treat females in the community abusively and also don't get held accountable for that. So I think there's just the culture of abuse and of denial and of not taking responsibility. And if we want um, providers to take responsibility for how they treat their clients, we also have to take responsibility for ourselves and hold each other accountable. And so I just wanna bring that up. Um, I'm Myself and some other women are starting a female-led initiative in the community. Um, it's not quite ready to be announced, but this is one of the issues that we wanna work on. I just wanna get everyone thinking about it and hear some ideas for everybody. Thank I, you. I, I just wanna jump in, um, Bia Labate. Um, she's organizing the um, Psychedelic Liberty Conference next Week, but we just had in the psychedel in the sacred solidarity one of the elders that are allies at Thank You Plant Medicine, you know, unbeknownst to them, like they, you know, it was kind of like a, you know, there's it was, it was two people they knew, and then this other guy that I guess was a someone removed, just was just super problematic. And Bia, you know, just like, dude, you gotta get this guy out. I mean, I don't know, Elizabeth Chor, when you saw the like full stop on that flyer. No, you know, we had to, we had to like erase the guy. And, you know, and I was like, yeah, like, what do we, you know, she's like, look, we have a circle, like, you know, from like, she's deep in the Aya path. And like, there's this, we had a list of mm -hmm. serial predators that, you know, and the dude was just, you know, unrepentant and bad. And, and I was like, well, that's a great list to have. And definitely the community needs to have that, you know? And I think, yeah, we just need to come out of the shadows bring it above board and hold people accountable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hallelujah, community relationships. And it's hard because, you know, it's not like we can have a Yelp <laughs> right now. There's a lot of safety issues and privacy issues and legal issues. Uh, but having these like circulating letters, right? Like the abusive shaman, uh, Guillermo, what's his name? Uh, there, there was a there was an ayahuasca shaman who had many, many, many reports, and a and a letter circulated uh, that that uh, boycotted his visits. So things like that. And I look forward to hearing your ideas, Juliana. We'll stay in touch. We'll all stay in touch. Maybe I can interview you on my blog so people can stay in touch with you. Um, so thank you. Yeah, we're working toward that. It's it's a work in progress. And first, it will end with uh, stopping prohibition. Can I say something to you, Elizabeth? Yeah, please. Thank you. Um, one of the ways that is with Iboga and I began at least that we can sort of have a little bit more assurance with our safety is if there is actual nursing there or medical professionals um, 
we are very much held to standards of practice and uh, ethics and we can lose our license if we don't uh, abide by those. So if you were to be in a ceremony where you had nurses present and felt that you were violated, then you could take that up with that uh, nurses mm -hmm. board, uh, where, depending on the country you're in obviously, but yeah. So that might be one way to kind of have a bit of security. Obviously, you know, people are abusive in, in all lines of work and in, in all professions, but at least there is some accountability there with uh, with the medical profession that's not quite there yet with, you know, like with plant medicines and stuff because, yeah. Great point. That's good to know about the nursing and the medical side of it. You can go through that route. Um, great call. And Charles, you and I have spoken about this before. I was working on an article about this and, and we presenced... Um, also, what can happen in medicine work is the projection on onto the provider and idealizing the provider, and and uh, often someone who's not really aware or willing to be aware of that or to honor that can take advantage of that. Um, and you made some great points. If you want to chime in here on that kind of idealization and and your stance, yeah, I think no, this is an issue that like is you know, it, it happens. It's, it happens in the red, regular medical community with therapists. It happens in the MAPS training. It's just a reality of life that sexual relationships are going to be, um, they're going to be abused by some people. And the only way around that is to have regulations, to have oversight, and to have really good communication. And What's challenging about Ibogaine is you have desperate people going to situations and a lot of times people in drug addiction, whenever they get out of drug addiction, they're still looking for some way to get high. And sex and power and the, the dynamic that exists there are difficult. And so, you know, within the Ibogaine community, there's a, there, in the past, there was more, there was a lot of people that could just jump in and start serving medicine and start paying money to have ads on Google and people would come to their clinics. And that's been pulled back quite a bit. Um, Google has actually helped with that by eliminating all the addiction, uh, you know, all the addiction advertising across the board. But it's really, it's up to us to create standards of care and for women like Juliana to keep pressing this issue and for all of us and men included to support that and to really just like, every clinic needs to adhere to a certain standard. And I think that's, that's the important thing because, uh, yeah, this is, this is a reality that it's going to keep happening and we just have to know that it's going to happen and do our best to prevent it where we can and, and then find ways to support the people that it does happen to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we'll take a few more questions. I hear an echo if you want to mute yourself. Yeah. So a question from Brittany. Can anyone speak to the use of this medicine for addictions that are not substances like food, gambling, sex, et cetera? Uh, definitely, I, I know friends who have struggled with eating disorders who have found a lot of help with the medicine. I also struggled with eating disorders uh, before I came across ayahuasca now they're they're gone <laughs> um, so that was resolved before I came to Iboga but I, I have heard of that I have heard of help with gambling and porn gaming like behavioral addictions absolutely there there's a lot there with your intention with the the intention and the magic to intention this might sound obvious but to mean it to mean it 110 percent and the medicine will help if you have good medicine, good provider, good set setting and community. You know, these medicines have been held in tribes for so long. And that's a piece missing from a lot of the psychedelic research is where is the tribe and what's their place in this work? And a lot of us are creating those tribes, but a lot of people don't have those. So when you have a tribe that's willing to call you by your sacred name and help you to remember your purpose, that's very important. Would anyone else like to speak to the behavioral addictions of the speakers? 
Elizabeth, I'd just like to add that, um, you know, breaking destructive cycles isn't, isn't just about addiction and that there's a lot of little ways that we are depriving ourselves of, of love and of the nourishment, the regular nourishment that we need, you know, because we think we don't have time or because we think other things deserve it more, you know, of our attention. And um, just that real deep inner look inside and seeing yourself and uh, that experience of holding that mirror up and telling yourself that, that I love you, you know, that um, is what for me, uh, helped me break those <laughs> cycles. And, and, and just, I didn't know that I was hurting myself. You know, I didn't know that I was, you know, missing out until I started really focusing back on giving myself that love and, and, and feeding myself properly. You know, and, and just one more, um, uh, Chor and Elizabeth are going to be on a panel, uh, Sacred Solidarity with, with Dr. Gabor Mate, who wrote um, In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, Close Encounters with Addiction. And it's an amazing book. And, you know, one of his fundamental insights is in the Buddhist sense, we're all addicts, we're all addicted to, you know, attached to stuff that will never satisfy in an ultimate way. And, you know, like we look at, oh, the addict over there, but we're all on the spectrum of addicted to whatever you know just that is not unhelpful and habits of thought and i'm not worthy and all that kind of stuff you know like we're just yeah so to break that those loops and ruts and get out of that and i is amazing and i boga beautiful thank you Yes, looking in the mirror. Chor is good at holding up the mirror. <laughs> For sure. We have a question from Andrew. I have noticed my experiences with mushrooms that with smaller psychoactive doses, I found myself almost between worlds in a sense, walking, waking consciousness, what people would call ego and full physical disassociation that has been uncomfortable at times. Um, so, Andrew, would you, let's see, so is this a question of, like, unity consciousness? Like, do you experience unity consciousness with Iboga or ego dissolution? Uh, I think um, that's, that's, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I was talking about, um, like, on doses, and sometimes a lot of people will be taking smaller doses, perhaps, of Iboga and might not even scratch the surface of what could be possible and might actually find themselves kind of off balance whereas if they were to take a larger therapeutic dose they would have an experience that would take them enough outside of their normal consciousness that it might be more helpful um, and sometimes people hesitate out of fear or not having support and don't really take a dose strong enough to really help a whole lot. I was wondering about the efficacy of smaller doses and the destabilizing sure. effect of smaller doses potentially. Sure, yes. Uh, thank you. That's a good question. Definitely, they're, they both have benefits and they're both different. And microdosing is something that is practiced by, by our Buiti teachers to study the medicine, to study the spirit of the medicine and to be informed in our daily life in our ordinary life it's a different experience it's but a very valuable and and certainly the deep dives are very valuable with the right support that's what i would say if anyone else wanted to jump in yeah i I'd, I'd say in, in reference to the destabilization that happens with iboga or ibogaine um I, it's not it's not like that liminal space where you're just uncomfortable Generally speaking, it's a complete fragmentation of mind. I mean, having gone through that myself after in, in a following experience, um, which lasted for many days, it, it's not as if you have, it's like nothing, you know, I mean, yeah, it, it just happens because your mind can't piece anything together. And um, it just kind of breaks you for a little while. And yeah, I mean, it can happen with any psychedelic experience, for sure. And maybe some people are more comfortable than others in that place. 
but generally speaking, uh, it's not at lower doses. It's usually like it's it's enough and it hits someone and it lasts for, yeah, I mean, this medicine takes a long time. Like Patrick said, he was the down for five days. Like this isn't something you're talking about. Oh yeah, four or six hours, I'm gonna go for a hike. No, this is like 24 hours, you're in your bed, you can't move. And then when you do get out of bed, you fall down. And then when you try to talk to someone, words don't even come out. So it's not like, and you can't sleep for four days. So all of that combined, it's a little bit different than just, I, you know, strong mushroom or a strong ayahuasca or, you know, even, even a strong, whatever, you know, 5-MEO experience. And it's, it stays with you and it kind of just rocks you. Thank you, Charles. So here's a question from George. All that has been said is so helpful. Thank you. There must be another level of interaction with iboga, which is direct communication, even before actually ingesting it. Is what I think you mean. Um, how do we communicate at a less physical encounter? Um, just certainly there's nothing like actually taking iboga into our body. The Bwiti say that that's how, that's how it does its magic and communicates with us and, and builds a bridge with us and a relationship initially. And then the spirit really is always with you is my understanding. And cultivating the plant if you can, but I don't, I don't know how that works very well here, but that can be a great way to connect with a plant. Um, okay, we have a question from Carter. I'll see Carter. Uh, I have been addicted to fentanyl for the last few years. Thank you for sharing that. Um, ah, the patches. And what steps do I need to take beforehand in order to safely and effectively receive ibogaine treatment? Patrick, you want to jump in? Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, First and foremost, I mean, you're gonna fennel. Fennel is really powerful, right? You know, it's so much more vastly powerful than than your regular short acting morphine and such. And you you found yourself in a knot where that's where you're at now. You know, get it cut down. First of all, I mean, we used to do it where we could you could roll right up and you could come right in and you could, we just could treat you, you know, but it's, it's not really meeting the spirit with full intention for one. And, you know, for two, there's so much other stuff that's involved now in the, in the Medicaid, the drugs that are out there, but get stepped down, go see your doctor, get stepped down. If you can, maybe he can put you on a, a, a shorter acting drugs, like a morphine of some sort. There's lots out there, depending on where you are, um, where you're living is they'll have different things. I know if you're in Canada, we have different things we can put people on for that. And they have a, different areas, have different other kind of things. Ask your doctor, ask your doctor at your clinic. There's a few different places you can go to look, you know, not just your family doctor to search around, do some due, due, due diligence. But, you know, there's other things you can do too. I mean, there's this Kratom and there's a bunch of other stuff that, you know, that are open antagonists and that that can help. But then again, it's, you know, do due diligence, find someone trusted who knows what they're doing. It's not just Dr. Google because all these things do come with it. And it's, it's a, you're playing with your life, right? So you want to do it right. But I would start with you at your home with your doctor and have start the conversation and see where that leads you. And I think too, what you're referring to is when we're doing iboga treatments and that we just find that mm -hmm. with fentanyl, um, it just stays in the body longer. It's mm -hmm. again, like one of those kind of sticky drugs that really gets into the tissues. Mm -hmm. So um, people will come in and, and ha do a ceremony, which means to take the medicine and then um, be doing quite well. And then all of a sudden just go into sort of withdrawal again and mm -hmm. be very, very uncomfortable. So um, I'm not, I'm not personally a hundred. I think Ibogaine is probably a little bit um, more uh, better uh, to start with that with fentanyl and 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 then move towards if you can mm -hmm. doing an iboga ceremony if you want to yeah. more of that psycho spiritual aspect but yeah so that's kind of like what we're talking about when we're saying that it would be better to switch to short acting morphine 
and then sort of decrease your doses there and then and then come in to to iboga i'll just throw in here too because i i i know that there's also some effect on the heart from fentanyl is that right that's formidable so sometimes people can need to kind of rehabilitate their cardiac health some I think, you know, detoxes are really tricky. You know, people, when they come into detox, they're not healthy. You know, when people are really abusing drugs, you're not healthy. You know, you're not eating well, you're not sleeping well. You're, you know, so it's, it's just, yeah, it takes, it takes work and it takes time and it's not, you know, results. It's, you know, working with your provider and making a plan and, and doing, trying to get on a path that's gonna bring you into the ceremony, whether you do iboga or ibogaine, that's gonna be, you know, give you the best results, right? And, and, and as safely as possible. Well, I just wanted to shout out Dost um, to, for, for the questioner. The, the mm -hmm. Dost will be screening as part of the movie section of um, Sacred Solidarity. You get to choose three movies and Dost is one of them. And I felt like, you know, like these are the superheroes from a bogus soul that really help Adrienne. And it's her story of, you know, just a really honest and amazing portrayal of her addiction and path to recovery. And it's a totally twisting and turning, very honest. And, um, but yeah, I felt like that one to get her onto morphine, you know, get her off of the whatever horrible thing, uh, you know, to something that was easier to step off, like just all the insights. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how that movie was just like amazing and just really, and she'll be on the panel as, as well. Awesome. Yeah, that sacred solidarity coming up. What a gift to the community when we need to connect and have a day. Uh, and also to respond, uh, Carter, I'll just call you Carter because I don't, I don't want to read your whole handle. Um, that y there's also connecting with someone like Jonathan or myself that have, and we're not trying to be medical professionals, but in supporting supporting people to make their own choices uh, for transition and there are resources around kratom kratom is also sensitive with sourcing kratom is also being over harvested kratom is also being found to be adulterated i list uh on let's see uh so i i, I do have like a list of community recommended sources of kratom and there's certain strains of kratom and then there's like high vitamin C that, that can go along with a kratom transition. But again, we don't want to mix fentanyl with kratom either because that can be deadly. That can, that can cause a lot of problems. We want to be very careful with a transition and I've seen people walk through it. It's really beautiful. So uh, Jonathan's website has a lot of resources. I'm going to do a blog post about kratom uh, soon. We'll, and, and you're, uh, you're welcome to email me for those sources that I know are safe, which would also be, in essence, an alternative to a short-acting opiate, which can be more dangerous, which can be slippery, too. So those are some options to, to prepare. And the cleaner you come to the medicine, the more it gives you. The more it can bless you up, the, the better place you'll be left at the end. So, and the medicine likes that when we give of ourselves. You can go to the ticket link for this event and you can see all of our websites there. My website, Jonathan's website, connect, uh, and we'll go, we'll go from there. And yes, thank you. <laughs> I love these comments. We're just getting started. We could go for days and just need a little root bark. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so we'll wrap it up here soon. And let's see, okay. Here's a question from Erica, thank you. Um, let's see. Is that a question? Okay. For help with PTSD, trauma, and addiction issues. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so just comments. All right. Um, here's a question. It seems that there's a, from Eve, thank you. It seems that there is an understanding that for opiates and alcohol, there is a scrubbing of the brain receptors. Can you speak to how iboga works with trauma? Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Trauma survivor uh, here. And, and I know that the, the neuroplasticity is helpful. This is, allows us to be supple 
and change and the neurogenesis. We are growing, isn't that right, Patrick? This is a part of Iboga too. And, and more, the spiritual teachings and guidance straight from the plant, having conversations, nuanced conversations. Uh, how do I heal this? And it gives me a practice and a download, but then I have to practice because the medicine wants us to mature our consciousness and make choices, but it will help us with that. So where I could have revisited the same fear and guardedness, or I could make a decision to move in a different direction and guide my mind in a different direction. And the medicine is supporting me, giving me the neurological and physiological support to actually change uh, and to find forgiveness, you know, authentic forgiveness in our hearts and not, not just intellectualized forgiveness, but full body forgiveness and moving through into the, into what's next. The medicine loves that question. What's next? What's forward? What's your bliss and how to get there? Um, so uh, I wanted to share that. i if anyone else wanted to share anything, please jump in. Otherwise, I will read another question and we'll close. So lots of great comments and questions. I wish we could get to all these. And, and yes, it was ending at 930 um, uh, in total. So let's see, decrimca.org. Thank you, Kelly, for decriminalizing mushrooms and I think that's it. We'll close. We'll close. And thank you. There's Juliana's email if people want to connect. Um, and okay, Claire has one offering. Can you address uh, that many watching have no experience with iboga ibogaine who are considering taking medicine? Please connect with an expert. Yes, absolutely. Um, someone who is highly experienced. Self-administration is one of the highest risk factors especially in detoxes. Absolutely. That's, and we understand a lot of people are needing healing and then we have privilege and access conversation, right? Not a lot of people need and want this medicine, but aren't able to access it or don't know about it and don't have the cultural bridges and community context to, to hold this. So we're working on that. And then Chor is very passionate about that, creating, cultural conversations and, and hopefully projects like the one that David is talking about um, with sustainable ibogaine, that's gonna help. We would love to see a world where everyone can get ibogaine on insurance, <laughs> you know, if they wanted to, with like really high frequency, high level uh, capable providers that Patrick will train. <laughs> so so we're, we're moving through that. Uh, so we understand, you know, self-administration is is a, is a great risk and people are risk takers like Jonathan said and there's so many ways that we can prepare that we can do something now with Kratom with the with the uh, holistic detox protocols there's so many tools that we can start to make life a little better now so we're at 9 30 I want to Thank everyone here, Basi, from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for sharing your most precious commodity of time and wisdom and experience with us. And to be continued, stay tuned. Please, um, sure. one, one quick thing, uh, just follow Third Wave, connect with Patrick. You can find us on social media, uh, connect on the email list at ebast.net if you would like to be notified of Patrick's deeper immersive medical safety training. Yes, Charles. Yeah, there's just, there's one question I want to address really quick with uh, the use of 5-MeO-DMT and oh, thank you. which is which is being used in clinics in Mexico. Um, and the reason behind its use, and I can speak to this personally, is that a lot of times when people are doing Ibogaine for addiction, they don't have the most profound experience. Sometimes it's just a straight detox. And so they come out of that feeling pretty good, but there's still no deep internal lasting meaning for them. And so 5-MeO-DMT is a profound and reliable and consistent experience that is, you know, just, there's no words. It's, it's remarkable. And so it has been seen to be effective in providing that spiritual component and it's also challenging 
because it is, it, it is potentially hazardous and deaths have been associated with the concurrent use. We'll say concurrent use because Ibogaine is still in the system when people are uh, using 5-MeO-DMT even though it was many days prior. Uh, and so, you know, there's a, there's a danger there. And so it really is a question of, yeah, I mean, it's risky. It's probably not the safest thing to do. And yet, speaking personally from the perspective of someone who went through addiction and watching many people go through that, uh, it is powerful, a powerful tool for healing. So, mm -hmm. you know, again. Thank you, Charles. Yes, it, it can be a, a, a great christening at a, at a moment. And what we found in our framework that was developed by a Bwiti healer that uh, multiple treatments are needed multiples mm -hmm. multiple for a true detox where you're healing the soul and not just getting back to zero you want to get back to get up to you know the full expression of your soul that might require several treatments i've seen that before with people coming out of ibogaine still in post-acute withdrawal symptoms and a few more deep deep buiti ceremonies after that they're they're somewhere else they're free uh -huh. Uh, yeah, with totally. a lot of the work. And I'll add too, just for the opioid questions, healer.com, cannabis. Cannabis is a great ally. Um, healer.com has a medical cannabis training. And at healer.com, they have a guide for uh, substituting or, or um, so partially or completely substituting opioids with cannabis is possible. And that's also strain dependent and, and, and the, the delivery method. But cannabis is such a great ally to help us uh, soften the edges, these razor edges of this intense detox and also have a healthy endocannabinoid system. Okay, so much, we could go for days. Elizabeth, but, one yeah. more? we've talked so much about addiction is I always like to um, remind people that anytime you go through an addiction um, detox of some kind that we always have to have the conversation about, about uh, opioid naivety and that overdoses often happen after treatment when people relapse. So um, it just is something to be aware of for, you know, especially family and friends that are supporting them once they go home, that that, that is something that's important to remember. Hallelujah, like the most important point <laughs> medically, like one of the most, one of the most, it's so vital. The tolerance drops after a flood dose of iboga. And if people have a trigger, they're far more likely to OD. And we've seen that, you know, there needs to be so much support. So thank you for bringing that up. You have no tolerance after iboga. You know, we all have to be really careful. Blessed love, one love, all one. Basi, Boogie, Nia, David, Patrick, Michelle, Charles, Jonathan, thank you. You can find us on that Basi. event invite. Thank you for joining us and we'll, we'll get this online to revisit later. Hope to see you again. Thank you all. Basi. Thank, Basi. You. Basi. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, much right. love. Thank you. Bye. Bye.